I'm confident to say that we are again hosting a truly exceptional scholar of American religious history. Dr. Jennifer Graber is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. Her first book, The Furnace of Affliction, Prisons and Religion in Antebellum America, is insightful for myriad reasons, but personally, I was instructed by its reminder that theology in 19th century America didn't only happen in revival tents, seminaries, and churches, but also in unexpected places like prisons by unexpected people like wardens, prison reformers, and chaplains. Moreover, this theology at times was not only awful, but also dangerous and destructive. Um, and I think it's an essential read for those attempting to articulate a theological response or do the work of justice in this age of mass incarceration. So I'd suggest that book to you. Um, her upcoming book from Oxford University Press, Forged an Empire, The Meeting of Indian and American Religious Worlds, stretches us again to look beyond just plantations and the kingdom of Utah and the anxious bench to understand American religious identity and to see the central place of the res reservation um, in crafting American identity and American Christian identity. I think today she will help us to see some of the remarkable religious transformations that occurred in this space. Um, and we are so pleased to have you share your work with us, Dr. Graber. Please welcome me in joining her. Good morning, good morning. Um, I wanna thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, I want to thank everyone who came out this morning, and I want to thank everyone who did all the detail work to help make my trip possible. So thanks. It's great to be here. Um, I titled my lecture, or my series of lectures, uh, Religious Encounters in Indian Territory. And I've separated the two lectures, uh, I've put the lectures in two parts, missionary perspectives and native perspectives. So in this first lecture, I want to talk about Americans including American missionaries, as they experienced encounters with Indians on the Southern Plains. The second lecture will focus on how a particular Indian nation, the Kiowas, experienced Americans, including American missionaries, entering and settling in that region. But I want to start with this image as a way to evoke a sense of the place. It's a field of wildflowers before the Wichita Mountains. The Wichita Mountains is a range in what's now southwestern Oklahoma, and it was at the heart of the area that the Kiowas considered their homeland. It is considered a special place among Kiowa people, and it was a place that Americans also longed to settle near and control uh, over the course of the 19th century. There's been a lot of historical work, both good and bad, about the encounters between missionaries and Native Americans. But the twist I want to offer today in my own investigation is to focus on land. Land like this land in the image. A land that brought people together, ways of living on that land that caused them to be unable to dwell with each other. They lived on that land differently. Ways of living on the land shaped by religion religious practice, religious belief, and the way that religion was remade as these two communities had conflicts over this land. I think that ideas about land have been missing from our histories of missionary and Indian encounter. And I think that's probably because issues of land are often missing from our histories of Christianity in the United States. And I add it not only because both Americans and Kiowas had religious ideas about the land. They certainly did, and I'll talk about that today. But I also want to emphasize that these encounters had important material conditions. Important com material conditions that undergirded those experience, religious experiences they had with one another. These were not abstract encounters. They were encounters and struggles over inhabiting a place and how to rightly inhabit it. So I want to put land central to this encounter in a way that I think historians have sometimes missed. So I ask you to kind of take this little trip 
into a focus on land with me um, to see what we can see. And I want to start in this lecture with the missionaries. In the next lecture, as I said, I'll get to the Kiowas. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how there are the broader American attitudes about Indians and their land and how missionaries at times shared those attitudes, but also at times rejected broader American attitudes. So I want to cover how they got themselves into Indian territory, what they experienced when they got there, how it changed them, and how it changed Indian life as well. So I want to talk about the Southern Plains. The Southern Plains came into American ownership with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Before that, it was a part of New Spain. And it was acquired partly out of a need for land. Americans wanted land to settle on and to create homesteads, farming homesteads on. And it was becoming increasingly difficult to find enough land for settlers east of the Mississippi because Indians occupied great tracts of that land east of the Mississippi. This was land that settlers wanted. And most Americans thought that Indians residing on these large tracts of land east of the Mississippi had too much land. And they didn't do anything with the land. They held unnecessary amounts of land. They talked about it as surplus land, land that wasn't being used properly. And it, this was related, of course, to a kind of critique of Indian life, a critique that Indians weren't doing the right things with their land. And the thing that was kind of interesting about this is that there were actually Indians east of the Mississippi who farmed in some ways. They usually also hunted and gathered, but many of them actually did things like grow corn, um, but they didn't farm in the same way that Americans farmed. And so many Americans looking at Indian communities east of the Mississippi, even those that actually had farming traditions, didn't really see farming when they looked at Indian life. And they used that as a critique, that Indians didn't use land properly. And so what they wanted was for Indians to relinquish these vast tracts of land east of the Mississippi, that they would settle on smaller tracts of land and learn to farm correctly. Um, so that became the kind of ideal, uh, that they would join in this ideal way of life, the small American farm homestead. And we could see this already in George Washington's administration. Already in that first presidential administration, there was an effort to get Indians east of the Mississippi to relinquish their lands and settle on smaller amounts and create farms, right? Start to learn to farm, at least in an American way. The very first Iroquois reserve was created already in the 1790s uh, in what's up now upstate New York. Um, it was created in the 1790s and religious folks were some of the first to volunteer to assist Indians in their transition to their life of, from hunting and gathering to a life of American farming. So the Quakers worked on the Iroquois reserve to try and teach Indians how to farm. So there's actually a long history of this desire to change how Indians inhabit land, um, to living on less land and to farm in ways that Americans found recognizable. This, of course, then is the backdrop to the Louisiana Purchase. Americans need land for, for more farms, and they need to get Indians out of the way. So when Jefferson purchased the Louisiana Territory in 1803, it was really to fulfill two uh, desires, to get Indians to move west if they weren't going to relinquish their land in the east, and then to make more room for people to farm. But that, even as uh, they purchased that land, they didn't necessarily have control of it or meet many of the Indians there. So this land came into American hands, but still most of the action was happening in the east. And it was happening not only through this push to get Indians to farm, but also through mission work. The biggest player in that mission work was an or, uh, organization founded in 1810 called the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the ABCFM. And even though they had the word foreign in their title, they also had a very big set of domestic concerns. And that domestic concern was mostly evangelizing Indians. So down on the bottom, you see a sending ceremony for the very first ABCFM missionaries. They actually went to India 
But very soon after these in, uh, missionaries were called to India, they started calling missionaries to go to the Cherokee people, to the Choctaw people. Um, so they went to places like Georgia and Tennessee. And I love this image on the upper left of one of those missions, one of the ABCFM missions. This one's in Tennessee. And you can see the way they pictured the ideal Indian life, a life with houses made of wood that were square, a life with orderly land and farms. So the ABCFM missionaries, even as they had evangelization as their primary goal, also supported this larger American vision of Indians transforming their way of living on the land to reflect how other Americans lived on the land. The ABCFM missionaries, even as they reflected those same attitudes about land, also got involved in the big debates about Indian land. They struggled when they felt like Indians were felt, uh, treated unfairly. So on the one hand, they believed Indians needed to farm. They believed Indians needed to live in houses and change many of the ways that they lived, not just religiously. They did not doubt that Indians needed less land and that Americans needed more of it. But on the other hand, they were some of the strongest voices asserting that Indians needed to be treated fairly in the creation of land treaties and deals. That uh, Indians needed, that Americans had an obligation to treat, uh, to treat with Indians ethically. They also said that these transitions that Indian communities were being asked to perform would take time. They urged other Americans not to be impatient, right? So they really called for fairness, but also patience uh, on, the Amer on the part of Americans. So I think they were kind of stuck in the middle in a certain way. Even as they agreed with Americans on many things, they also saw themselves as a kind of role of counsel to other Americans, um, not only on questions of fairness and questions of patience, but also about questions of contact. They were worried about American settlers. I mean, where does the term Wild West come from? From all those crazy characters who went out west and brought their brothels and their saloons and all their bad habits with them. So missionaries saw this. They saw the kinds of settlers that were coming westward, invading Indian lands, and they were worried about Indians coming into contact with settlers like that. So they had this kind of multiple set of concerns, and part of their concern was actually about the ethics of other Americans. This caused them to actually think that perhaps what was necessary was separation, that Indians might need to live separately from Americans, not because necessarily they were so much trouble, the Indians, but maybe because the Americans were so much trouble. So they really occupied this fascinating place um, and they got highly involved in debates over Indian removal. If you've ever heard of the Trail of Tears, it's the most infamous example of Indian removal in the 1830s, but thousands of Indians from across the east, uh, the east of the Mississippi um, were removed west of the Mississippi over the course of the 1830s. And ABCFM missionaries got very involved in the fight against removal. Why? because they thought it was unfair. They thought it was too soon. They did believe that Indians needed to probably move westward eventually. They did believe Indians needed to live separately from other Americans, but it was too fast. It was unfair. And when they saw the way that Indians were pushed out of their communities throughout the 1830s, they also called it unjust. So a few of them actually went to jail, wrote some really fascinating letters from prison. Um, over the uh, issue of Indian removal. But it's Indian removal that actually finally gets some of these missionaries close to Plains Indians. We finally get them into that area purchased uh, in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. So I wanna show you two images now. An image that these missionaries had of Indians from the east and these Indians in the unknown lands of the west. 
These are some, this was a famously circulated image uh, in the 1830s and 40s of what missionaries and other Americans called the five civilized tribes. The Choctaw, the Cherokee being the most famous. And missionaries had had great success among the Cherokee and the Choctaw. And many of them moved with the Cherokee and the Choctaw when they um, were removed uh, across the Mississippi River. Uh, and then they relocated with them basically in their new homes in Indian Territory. And what I find striking about this image is that these Indians look so dignified, right? One of them in the upper, uh, the upper left, he's reading. They have really fancy clothes on. They had a sense that these Indians had truly done what they had asked them to do. Many of them had become Christian. Many of them were farming. They had been unfairly removed. For the missionaries, these were the ideal Indians who now, because they had been moved to Indian territory, had to live near these Indians, the wild Indians. The wild Indians in the unknown lands of the Louisiana Purchase. What were these Indians like? Well, take a look at them in this painting from the 1840s. What are they doing? What in heaven's name are they doing? Some kind of bizarre religious ritual. Are they wearing any clothes? They don't have any permanent homes? These people were wild. And suddenly, these missionaries found themselves closer and closer to wild Indians. So I want to talk a little bit about their new experience in the land of wild Indians because they needed their land too. They needed their land for trails out west, for settlement, for development in agriculture, eventually for railroad lines. And it was full of people who were just doing nothing with it, according from, from their perspective. These Indians had even bigger tracts of land, and they had no traditions of farming at all, unlike some of those Indians in the East who actually grew some corn and squash. These folks didn't grow anything. They hunted buffalo and moved around. So the question was, what were they to do with the wild Indians? What would these encounters in Indian territory look like? And I want to give you two examples. I want to spend the rest of this lecture talking about two ways that American Christians interacted with the wild Indians of the plains. The first is with the Quakers, and the second is with a missionary from the Methodist Episcopal South. So the Quakers, they loved Indians. And they saw themselves as people with a long and really wonderful history with Indians. This is a famous painting. If you go to Philadelphia, you can see it hanging in municipal building there. Um, it's a depiction of William Penn's treaty with the Indians when Pennsylvania was founded as a colony. Look how peaceful it is. Everyone's getting along. Quakers prided themselves as being people who had good relations historically with Native Americans. They thought that other Americans really did not have good relationships with American Indians. And so when it was time to go further and further west, as Americans wanted to go west of the Mississippi, they offered themselves and their assistance. They offered their experience. And so in 1867, they wrote a memorial to Congress. In it, they called for four things, fair treaties, ethical administrators on reservations, protection from white settlers who were crazy, and this, although I can't read it from here. I'm gonna have to go around for a second. They called for, I wanted to assign the Indians the number of fertile tracts on well-watered acres, and they called for the Indians to be treated with respect and dignity. They called for the Indians to be treated with So the Quakers, too, thought the answer was smaller tracts of land 
moving from hunting to farming. And so the next year, they convinced the President of the United States to let them run Indian reservations. And the President said, sure. Um, and for the next 10 years, American religious bodies, including the Quakers, ran all the reservations across the American West with the Quakers at the forefront. So I wanna talk about one Quaker example of what that was like, one Quaker example in Indian territory. This is Lowry Tatum, who looks like the grumpiest Quaker of all time. Um, every picture of him, he looks like this. Um, he moved to Indian territory in 1869 to administer the new reservation for Kiowa Indians. He brought his wife, Marianne, with them, and they had really an amazing experience of this land, and truly, I would say at the beginning, a kind of fear of this land. They desired this land, they wanted this land to be settled and controlled by Americans, but their initial experience was one of fear. Um, they came with the hope that they could transform Kiowa people from hun uh, hunters to farmers, from living on big tracts of land to small tracts of land, but very quickly they realized this was gonna be very hard work. It actually wasn't land that was very good for farming on this reservation. There were never enough supplies. Indians, uh, Kiowa Indians expressed concern that actually they weren't intended by God to grow corn. It just wasn't for them. They said this over and over, that corn was for white people, uh, not for Indian people. Um, they didn't like square houses. They thought that the shape of the square was for white people, and Indians lived in circular housing, or teepees. So there were all kinds of really interesting kind of cultural back and forth um, as Lowry Tatum and his wife tried to bring about transformation. Um, but they also were just nervous. Um, I've read Marianne's diary, and one, uh, one day in 1870 she wrote, what trials and conflicts await in this land of heathen darkness where the darkness can even be felt God tests them, and they can only ask for his mercy. Vain is the help of man situated so far from the Christian world and surrounded by wild men of the woods. So they both are nervous, but very sure that they can affect this transformation at the same time. But it didn't go as planned, right? There were all sorts of reasons why this wasn't going as planned, and Quakers began to sense that it was more than just not wanting to hunt and farm. They began to see the Kiowa's religion as being part of their resistance to changing how they occupied the land. They said that they had all these rituals to the sun and the buffalo and the prairies, and that kept them from turning to a life of farming. So they got really, really nervous, and they really felt like it wasn't working, and in some ways, their concerns reflected a transition that was happening more broadly, I would say, in the United States because more and more Americans weren't farming anymore. I'll show you a slide from the USDA. I sometimes spend some time on the USDA website. And to me, one of the things that's most interesting about the way missionaries interacted with Native people is that they were pretty sure Native people learn, needed to learn how to farm. They needed to learn how to farm. But in 1870, the number of Americans farming was plummeting. Lots of Americans no longer felt like it was a viable way to live. How were they living? If they were living in the rural areas in 1840, by 1870, they were moving to the city. More than 40% of Americans lived in cities of 100,000 or more people um, by 1870. So at the very time that they're asking Indians to farm, to change their way of life and become the Thomas Jefferson yeoman farmer, many Americans were actually leaving that way of life, stopping farming, moving to the city. So the Quakers quit. After 10 years, um, they had various other kind of amazing trials and tribulations, um, but one of them mostly was their feeling that they had failed to transition the Kiowa Indians from hunters into farmers. And soon after they left, missionaries arrived. Not people who were going to administer uh, reservations, but rather ministers, people who were going to open uh, Indian churches 
And so I want to spend the rest of my time talking about this man, who also looks really grumpy. Um, I also found no smiling picture of him. This is John Jasper Methvin. Methvin was from Georgia, and he belonged to the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Um, if you remember, um, the Methodists split in half over the question of slavery before the Civil War, and they were still split in this period after the Civil War. He's a really interesting character. He arrives in Indian Territory first to work with the five civilized tribes. He has a long experience with the Cherokee and the Choctaw, and he's very successful. And so in 1887, when the larger church asked for a volunteer to go to the wild tribes, he says yes, because he's done a good job with the civilized tribes. So he says yes, and he's the very first missionary to the Kiowas. The Kiowas don't have a missionary among them until 1887, which is very late when you think about the history of encounters between missionaries and American Indians. So he brought with him a model he had used with the five civilized tribes. You start a school, and then you go out and visit the camps or the villages, and you encourage assimilation. You encourage assimilation in terms of how you dress, in terms of the language you speak, how you cut your hair, how you, uh, and how you farm, right? Moving, how you sustain yourself, moving from hunting to farming. Um, so he worked with the Kiowas, trying to get them to get excited about farming, encouraging new ways of living on the land. And he saw the importance of the land as he worked also toward evangelizing Kiowa people. So I want to show you a special place. This is Mount Scott on the Kiowa Reservation. And Methvin wrote this long autobiography at the end of his life, and in it he reflected on Mount Scott and the beautiful area around it. And he said, ah, oh, Mount Scott, Kiowas had been doing rituals there for generations. He knew it was an important place. And he said because it was such an important place to them, that's where he was gonna have his first tent meeting. So he goes out in 1888, for his first tent meeting, and he says, I heard lots of arguments, right? There were lots of arguments at first, but he started to get people interested. And he began to have a tent meeting every summer around Mount Scott. And eventually, a little Methodist congregation started at Mount Scott. And Methin was overjoyed. He wrote in his autobiography, here no more is seen the Indian dressed in his crude paraphernalia here is no longer the discordant haya of the Indian song, keeping time with the tom-tom and the rattle gourd. But each Sabbath morning, there gathers here a fine congregation of Indians, clothed and in their right minds, singing and making melody, melody unto the Lord in Christian song and grateful praise. He found a special spot. And in some ways, I think he's kind of an interesting character there. Um, he... I don't see that as a way of him, I, I see that as a way of him under, trying to understand the religious life of the Kiowa, what was important to them, and he understood this land was important to them. And so he wanted to make that land a place where Jesus could be. And it seemed to have worked. Um, he also encouraged changes of living. He encouraged Kiowas to build houses, and he was always frustrated when he wouldn't. Um, at one point he said, the government wants you to have houses and settle in homes and be happy, and I'm sure Jesus does too. <laughs> so he's an interesting guy in that he was really quite sensitive, I think, in certain ways to their appreciation of land. Um, but he also, you know, was pretty sure Jesus wanted you to live in a wooden square house, which I don't think Jesus ever lived in a wooden square house. Um, so, um, so Methvin, I think, is a really interesting, this is such an interesting character because he was part of this pressure on the Kiowas to change their way of life. Um, and he was desperately trying to be sensitive to them in certain ways, but in other ways you can see um, how he wasn't truly sensitive at all. And I think one of the most interesting things about his career is that it coincided with an effort called allotment. And that's the part I want to draw us then to the end here today. 
This is a really famous poster um, that circulated in the United States in the period of allotment. Allotment involved the disintegration of communal land holding for Indian nations and replaced it with individual plots assigned to individual Indians. Um, so it was a law enacted in Congress in 1887, and it was very deliberately understood to be something that would dissolve tribal bonds, that no longer would lands be held communally, but that Indi each, individu each Indian would now be treated as an individual, right? And that then they would be absorbed into the larger American citizenry that as long as they had those tribal bonds and had communal land holding, they could never truly be integrated as individual citizens um, into the United States. So the first thing that allotment did was break up the communal land holding, make a, uh, individual plots. The second thing it did was deal with the land that was quote unquote left over or surplus. Once every Indian was allotted their own homestead, there was extra extra that was then taken by the United States and sold to white settlers. Hence this poster, Indian land for sale. It's through the sale of allot allotment land um, that really grew the coffers. Uh, it was remarkably profitable for the United States government in the 1880s and 90s. Um, and the interesting thing to me is that allotment was overwhelmingly supported by Christian leaders and Christian missionaries. And they, did, they supported it because they felt like individual land ownership and farming was key to Indians becoming civilized and becoming Christianized. Um, that it was the only way that Indians would be invested in personal success and business success if they owned their own farms. As one reformer wrote in this period, because there were lots of Christians uh, involved in Indian reform, no people could reach a high state of civilization under this communistic landholding system. And without the incentive to labor and enterprise that the right to individual ownership of property inspires. So Christian missionaries supported allotment. They believed it would help make Indians civilized. They would finally farm because they would be forced to farm. It passed in 1887, as I said, and the process came to the Kiowas in 1892. Um, even though the law had passed a few years earlier, it takes until 1892 for um, the process of allotment to happen among the Kiowa, and Methvin, Mr. Methvin of the frowny face, uh, played a really interesting role. He was there when government officials came to set up the allotment to give each Kiowa man uh, their own individual plot. And he was there when Kiowas resisted. Kiowa said, this is not a treaty we want to sign. We won't do it. You're tricking us. You're tricking us into giving away our land. The American commissioners wouldn't listen to the Kiowa. And so the Kiowa went to Methvin. They went to his school. And because none of them could write, they asked him to write a letter, and he did. He wrote a letter, basically drafted a petition to Congress on behalf of the Kiowas saying that they resisted allotment, that they would not be tricked into giving away their land, and Methvin took the letter to the commissioners, and the commissioners said, we don't want your letter. Take it to the Indian agent. He'll send it to Congress. So Methvin, a very dutiful man, took it to the Indian agent, who then put it in his pocket and never sent it to Congress. And this became a kind of turning point for Methvin, who then was quite supportive of the Kiowas as they battled allotment all the way to the Supreme Court. The Kiowas had a court case that went to the Supreme Court in 1903 over allotment. And Methvin was their supporter all along the way. Why? Not because he didn't believe they shouldn't have allotments and farms, but because they had been treated unfairly, right, which is, had been a concern among missionaries uh, for generations. So I think Methvin's a kind of interesting character because allotment also hurt him. Remember, he had started a school. That was the way he started his uh, work among the Kiowa. This is his school and his very small staff 
It was called the Methvin Institute. And when settlers began to come into Kiowa land after allotment, he couldn't afford to keep the school any longer. The prices of the land were driven up as settlers uh, came flooded into Oklahoma by the thousands. So he lost the school land. And he wrote in his autobiography, the whole aspect of Indian territory changed from one of consecrated labor for the good of humanity to one of sordid gain and for selfish personal profit. I have never recovered from this disaster. There's such sadness. And this is actually at the very end of his autobiography. This is how he ends the story of his life, even though he lives for about 30 more years. Um, but this is how he ends the story of his life, the story of this disaster of losing his land. But I think there's a real irony here, of course. He felt so defeated by the loss of his precious school. He called it a disaster. But at the same time, I don't think he recognized the kind of disaster that the Kiowas were experiencing around him. He saw that they were being treated unfairly, but I don't think he saw their experience of losing land as a disaster for them, that they were experiencing loss, a much greater loss, huge tracts of land, a way of life that they had inhabited and lived out for generations. And so for me, I just want to reiterate this tie between American religion and land between missionary history and material concern. Missionaries sought to evangelize Indians, but the land situation complicated their efforts. Indians had very different ways of inhabiting the land. According to missionaries and other Americans, Indians had too much land. Americans needed that land for farming and industry. Yet Americans also did not acquire that land fairly, according to missionaries. So missionaries supported a set of interactions with Indians that pressured Indians to give up their land, pressured them to farm, and penalized them with isolation and control because of American impatience and American greed. And so in that sense, I think the missionary story necessarily involves a land story and that there's no missionary story that's not caught up in this story of the acquisition of Indian land. The way that missionaries at times supported American perspectives and at times recognizing the way they pushed back against Americans trying to acquire Indian land. Next time I really wanna focus on how Kiowas experienced this land and American entry into the land um, but for now, I'm open to taking your questions about the missionaries. Uh, I can actually, I know a lot of other missionaries too. I just gave you one example here today. Um, but how these folks came into the land and how their ideas about land shaped the kind of life they envisioned for Indians. So thank you. We now have an opportunity to bring questions to Dr. Graber. So I'll take those questions asking first um, for student questions, followed by any from faculty. Joel. And could you please introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Joel, a Masters of Divinity student, and thank you so much for uh, your, your sharing today. My question is, you talked kind of in this time period uh, about a simulation uh, between the two, uh, or between uh, the Christian missionaries and Native Americans, uh, kind of a civilization mm -hmm. of them, and then also allotment. My question is, is it fair to say that Christian missionaries saw Native Americans at this time as an enemy in any way mm -hmm. that they were not, that they were aware of what they were doing in these actions mm -hmm. and understood the consequences? Or is that imposing something that wasn't there and there actually was an attempt at true evangelism, mm -hmm. true help, and true 
community amongst two people? Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question. Um, and I think we have to really put ourselves back into the mindset of the period. Missionaries were some of the, I mean, Indian hating was rampant in the United States. Indian hating was rampant. There were American officials who regularly called for extermination, used the word extermination of Indian peoples. So in that sense, you can really see the contrast in terms of the missionaries saw themselves as offering a very different path. Um, and so I would say there's a kind of rival set of rhetorics uh, in the 19th century. Um, the people that are always proposing a military solution to the Indian, you know, because everyone thought there was an Indian problem. Um, and I'll use that in quotes. They didn't use it in quotes. They saw an Indian problem, right? Indians when we're on land that Americans needed. That was the Indian problem. Um, they had all these people who seemed like they could not assimilate into American life. Um, that's the Indian problem. There were lots of Americans who proposed a military solution to that. Missionaries saw themselves and other kinds of humanists or liberals in this period saw themselves as people taking a civilizing approach, a peaceful approach. Um, and so one of the things I'm interested in is how, um, I mean, yeah, they had great intentions. I mean, they were, I mean, they were about as nice as you could possibly be in this period to Indians uh, because there were not, there was no one, there was no one in this period, no white person, who did not think Indians needed to change and be utterly transformed. Nobody, nobody. The only argument was about how to do it, by force, how long it will take, what techniques it would require. So in that sense, they're like everyone. Everyone thought Indians needed to change. They simply, they wanted as best they could to do this without force, um, and they really, uh, I mean, they went and dedicated their lives. They lived in places in great difficulty. I actually have a ton of respect for these people that I'm writing about, even as they contributed, contributed to massive land loss in Indian communities. Um, so I think, I, I'm a, for me as a historian, I think it would be unfair to judge them in a way that we now look back upon that history, right? We look back on that history and the kind of consensus is often Indians were treated unfairly. That's how we view that today. That, it's a different world in the 19th century. Hi, thank you for your lecture. My name is Eric Landon. I'm an MDiv student, second year. Um, so you're talking about this period of allotment and around the same time as when the uh, Indian boarding schools started to open, right? Yes. I'm wondering if you could speak to that whole project um, mm -hmm. and how that relates. Obviously, there's some great continuity between the project of assimilation uh, mm -hmm. that you referenced even in earlier uh, missions, but specifically with the issue of land and the, uh, the, the interaction and the, um, the uh, responsibility mm -hmm. that Christians felt um, toward the native people in, in those projects and how, how that affected uh, land use and ownership and uh, posture toward it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the boarding school part of this history is really important and it's something that missionaries were highly involved in. As you saw, Methvin himself opened a school uh, and students lived at that school. So even though the school was on the reservation, students lived there. Um, but there was a parallel set of structures um, of boarding schools where Indian children would travel hundreds if not thousands of miles to um, boarding schools uh, in the East, in the American East, uh, particularly the Carlisle Industrial School um, in Pennsylvania. So I think one of the things, what the boarding school history shows, because it absolutely par parallels this history, um, is the way that missionaries noticed that they weren't very successful, right? They were not convincing people to speak English, farm, um, change their way of uh, dressing, change their marital practices, change their gender organization. And so at one point, they begin to reason that it has to start, that, that the pro they will never get adult Indians to change, and so that they would needed to focus on Indian children. Um, and so, and we can see this, this is a kind of global missionary strategy at this time, right? Education as kind of key to a change in the next generation. Um, and so missionaries, um, played a part in creating reservation schools, but also these um, off-site boarding schools. And they believed that the off-site boarding schools truly were the ideal 
because you could have no contact with your parents, right? No contact with your Indian culture. You had to start speaking English, right? You could be punished for speaking your native language. Um, and you learned industrial skills, right? The Carlisle School, the full name is the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. They taught Indians how to work, how to farm and how to work. Um, so it really does play into that um, desire to transition Indians from a life lived on large tracts of land to a life that only requires a small homestead. Um, so they absolutely learned skills. Um, so it was, it was crucial. And it's also a kind of um, a heartbreaking history, right? When we read narratives of Indian children who experienced boarding school. Um, and one of the, I think, a really interesting model for dealing with that history, at least right now, it's one step forward, is in Canada, which also has a very um, a, a long history of Indian boarding schools and suffering in Indian boarding schools, they have a kind of truth and reconciliation commission about the boarding school experience going on. Um, and it's not perfect, right? It's not perfect at all, um, but it's a step in the right direction in terms of acknowledging that history, which is a much kind of, I think, much lesser known history here in the United States. We have a question from um, a live stream participant. No way, this is the first time I've ever had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what was the relationship between the expansion of the West and with clear financial interest and the expansion of the mission movement? Ooh, that's good. Um, hmm. So you have to think about the way that the West is settled and that one of the key, the turning point years, of course, is this 1848 and 49 with the gold rush in California. Um, one of the reasons one of the first uh, trails is established through Kiowa lands is so that people can travel to California uh, and mine for gold. Um, so there is always industrial interest um, really play a part in how Indians experience um, American movement through the West. Um, and if the Kiowas had been further north, they would have experienced that in even greater uh, numbers, people coming across. The trail that went through the Kiowa lands was a little bit less traveled to California than some of the other major trails. Um, so the gold rush impacted this, um, and then other gold rushes in other places. Um, and then I would say, finally, the kind of, um, the Indian Territory is one of the last places to open up. Um, and the places around them are filling. Kansas, Arkansas, um, Missouri, those places are all kind of filling up with people. Um, people who are both farming but also uh, looking toward industrial mining kinds of development as well. So I would say all of this is tied to industry and missionaries have a very, um, they have this ambiguous role that they play in that. Like remember Methvin, he's so brokenhearted when his school, uh, when he loses his school, um, because no longer were white people there to do consecrated labor, right? The mission, the labor of being a missionary. Now people were there to make money. Um, so he really saw that as a setback. Um, so I think missionaries had a very um, difficult relationship with uh, evolving capitalism. Um, so in my mind, the history of mission is really tied to the history of industrialism in the United States. And missionaries are this very interesting, they have this interesting place because they both support Indians moving toward more and more kinds of American style living, what they called civilization, but they also, they were nervous about greed and nervous about too much profit and nervous about, you know, they, they were unnerved by what they saw in the history of capitalism as well. Further questions from students or faculty? Go Chris and then Mary. Good morning, thank you. My name is Chris, I'm a student. Um, you kind of mentioned about Methvin's use of Mount Scott. Mm -hmm. and it seems kind of like a stunted contextualization, uh, understanding. Are there other models? And, and specifically, I guess I'm asking, um, you know, there's a Jesuit history as well in yes. America that's a little bit different. I was noticing these are all 
obviously widespread as Protestantism mm -hmm. in the United States at this period of time, but I was wondering if you could speak to maybe other seeing what Methvin is doing or other uh, models that we're starting to do, mm -hmm. kind of noticing how to, I guess, utilize um, religious places yeah. uh, and their growth, their That's their a great question. Um, and I think that missionaries, missionaries kind of either tapped into or were worried about different things in Indian life. So for Methvin, he saw the importance of place and he very strategically selected those places. And in that sense, he follows in the footsteps of, uh, I mean, he would, he would never have said this himself because he was highly anti-Catholic, but he follows in the footsteps of uh, Catholic colonization in places like Mexico, right, where there was a very deliberate, or in New Mexico, very deliberate building of new sites on top of older sacred sites. Um, I think Methvin, I think Methvin's intention's a little bit different because in, in that Catholic model, there was this sense like, this is the replacement. Um, I think Methvin's model, Methvin was replacing, but he also was saying, I get it. I get that they value this spot. Um, other missionaries had different relationships with those kinds of things. So there was, um, there was a, a Dominican priest uh, who was present. He came in 1891, and he's really interesting. He, ne he didn't necessarily recognize place, but he didn't mind Indian dancing. He had no problem with Indian dancing. He did not think it contradicted Christianity. And even when the ghost dance movement, maybe some of you have heard of the pan-Indian ghost dance in the late 19th century, the most famous form of it was the Lakota ghost dance, and which in the end, uh, Americans attack the ghost dancers and it leads to the massacre at Wounded Knee. Um, the Kiowas also did the ghost dance. And in it, they were hoping to see their dead relatives. They were um, uh, hoping that the buffalo would come back to the plains. And Father Ricklin was like, hey, that's all right. He went to watch. Um, whereas the Protestant missionaries just went bananas, right? They, they hated Indian dancing, and they thought the ghost dance was the most terrible thing they'd ever seen. Um, and so they would go, and they would literally try to stop it um, unsuccessfully. Um, so I think they had different, uh, they had different uh, relationships around Indian languages. Some missionaries were, thought that that was a really valuable thing to do, to learn Indian language, translate Bibles into Indian languages, maybe create songs and hymns in Indian languages. Others saw Indian languages as a big problem. Um, so I think there's a real variety. To me, that's one of the interesting part about surveying lots of different missionaries um, because they picked up on different parts of Indian culture and saw those parts as their way in, right? So for Methvin, I think place was his way in. Uh, for Ricklin, it was dancing. Um, there's another, there's a female missionary, um, a, a single woman who goes out and lives in a teepee for years. Um, she's really amazing. Um, she works especially with Indian women um, and really learns about their handicrafts and their art, and that's her way in. Um, so, yeah, it happened in different forms, and to me that's a really kind of interesting part of the story. Mary Chase Solak, I'm on the faculty. Um, was there any medical missionary work going on uh, during this time? As certainly this changing relationship forced, um, changing the relationship of Native Americans to their land had an impact on their uh, physical well being. So were medical missionaries involved? Mm -hmm. So on the Kiowa Reservation, there were no medical missionaries, but the government supplied a re reservation doctor starting in 1868. Um, and, and actually, the doctor's experience, um, the doctors had to write a report every year about what they did. Um, so we actually have some access to what the doctors were thinking and doing at this time. And my sense about the medical mission um, is that people were not physically well. You're absolutely right. Um, there were waves of epidemic disease. Um, there were um, problems with malnutrition. Um, as the Kiowa were being forced to stop buffalo hunting, um, they had to work, uh, they had to survive on rations, and rations were usually um, not in enough quantity and also bad quality, right? Like rotten flour was common. Uh, rotten beef was uh, very common. So people would get sick from the food, they didn't have enough food, um, and they would get sick from these waves of epidemic disease. So people were not well, which, um, challenged their traditional modes of healing. 
right? They have people who are understood as healers, both physical and spiritual, right? Who took the role of both spiritual and physical healing. Um, and yet these healers who had these long traditions of working with people, making them better, were being confronted with forms of illness they had never seen before. So this was a real crisis also for the way that they understood healing to happen. And then they also now have this white doctor um, who is, prescribes very different sorts of things. And to me, the most kind of acute example of how all of these issues come together around the issue of healing um, is that in 1891, a measles epidemic hit the schools. And so there were a couple different uh, schools uh, where students lived. And the biggest school, which was run by the US government, um, like every child got measles, like 200 kids got measles. And the administrator of the school, um, rather than keeping everyone there and nursing them back to health there, sent them all home. And the, the, and the way they talked about it, the medicine men didn't know what to do. Right? And so apparently the medicine men were trying to bathe them all in rivers to make them better, which actually is terrible for measles, right? Getting bathed in water when you have measles is very bad. So tons of people died, tons of children died, and it caused many Kiowa parents to associate illness with the school and the Christian mission, right? Because many Christian missionaries were running schools. So all of the, and, and the ineffectiveness of the doctor there, but also the ineffectiveness of their own medicine men. So it just, it was a catastrophe, right? So this medical problem really is also a spiritual problem um, and, and experienced in this like heartbreaking level of loss. So I think you're right, like uh, changes in how you treat the body were also part of this transformation. And it was, and it was so grueling um, and, it, and one added level, I mean, it's so, these are really terrible stories. I'm, I'm like gonna depress all of you. Um, but in 1883, um, the government in their push to assimilate Indians actually outlawed the practice of medicine men in reservations across the West. So if a medicine man was actually caught or reported to be doing traditional healing of any kind, um, they could be fined and if they did it again, they could be jailed. Right, so they're, they're not only undergoing this sense of like new illness that maybe they can't confront, but also it's illegal for them to be doing. So it's just, the struggle is so great. Further questions? Good morning. Good morning. Sorry I'm a little late, so I'm hoping this question hasn't been asked. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a little bit about any interaction or intersect, mm -hmm. uh, intersection between um, this history and the African Americans? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, because that's part of, one of the things that the history, historians of American Christianity have done well is focus on the history of slavery and focus on the religious impact of the Civil War, the religious impact of Reconstruction. That has been a place of great focus. Indians have not been a place of great focus um, for historians working in the late 20th century, early 21st century. But I think for people living at that time, Indians and the problem of slavery were both very big on the horizon. Right, that, that, that both of those issues, among others actually, like the Mormon problem, the anti-Catholic problem, uh, Chinese labor, pro like that, that, the, that people connected the issues around slavery with a host of other questions, including the Indian question. So one of the things um, that to me is really interesting is the way that missionaries were always comparing the Indian situation to the situation with African Americans. And in the allotment, debate, it was really interesting. Missionaries loved it. When that legislation passed, they said, this is the Indians' Emancipation Proclamation. Mr. Dawes, who brought the legislation, it was called the Dawes Act, is the Indians' Lincoln. Right? So you can see the way that um, they coupled these, they coupled these histories of marginal, marginalized populations to each other, even though that those were very different situations, right? The ending of slavery and the allotment, but they tried to make comparisons. 
in really interesting ways. Um, they were often making commentary. Um, and before they had an Indian uh, school, their first Indian boarding school, um, but they wanted to get people educated, they sent them to Hampton Institute, which was a school for freed slaves. So you could see the way that they saw parallels in these populations. Helen Hudgens, I'm faculty in the undergraduate side. Um, I wonder if you could follow that question up with a commentary about, um, I'm just struck by the embrace of African Americans of Christianity in a way mm -hmm. that was not parallel with uh, First Nations peoples. Yes. Do you think that had to do with land and the fact that the uh, African Americans had no land and at least on this continent, mm -hmm. and that there was, and the spirituality connected with land that was so strong with First Nations people. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. I think lots of, I think this was something missionaries wondered about. Why was it that so many African Americans took part in the Second Great Awakening and joined the Methodist movement and joined the Baptist movement and went to revivals? Like why did African Americans overwhelmingly move into Christianity in the 19th century? And the same was not true for Indians, right? Like it takes a long time and there were lots and lots of Indian nations where People were not receptive for decades. So I think that, that I think the dynamics of slavery have a lot to do with it, and the particular dynamics of American slavery, that it was very difficult to sustain traditions, religious traditions from Africa, whether it was certain kinds of African uh, ancestor worship, whether it was Islam, um, whether it was actually Roman Catholicism. Actually, some enslaved people brought with them practices of Roman Catholicism. So. Um, because of the way that the American system of slavery worked, often people from the same region were separated from one another. Um, people uh, were, uh, there was uh, a real suppression of uh, all sorts of religious practice early. Um, you know, there was a sense that they did not want anyone kind of keeping those traditions. Uh, people weren't with other people, um, like as people were separated from others in their culture, um, which was very deliberate on the part of slave owners. Um, there was, it was really, what some people argue is that it was almost impossible to sustain religious traditions from Africa. This is a very long and fraught uh, argument in the scholarship because some people say, no, actually people really did keep some things. There are others who say nothing, nothing survived the uh, institution of slavery. So that's, um, so I think that the, the fact that Indian peoples got to keep living together um, and some of them actually continued to live on their land. So even though Kiowas ended up living on reduced land, significantly reduced land, it was still land that they considered theirs. Um, and a few of their place, special places they still had access to. Um, so I think in that sense, there, was much more, there were many more cultural resources for sustaining traditions um, or for being more in, having more autonomy to create new traditions and make choices. Uh, Stephen Chester. Um, you began uh, sketching the, the story for us in the 1830s mm -hmm. um, by telling us about the, the civilized tribes being forced to move from uh, east of the Mississippi to, to west of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, are there patterns of intercultural interaction that emerge there between the, the, the civilized tribes as oh. they're forced to move and the, the Plains Indians? There is interaction and it's not positive. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, so this was such a fascinating um, moment because the people who moved when, when Jefferson and, uh, uh, and then later, of course, Andrew Jackson, right? He's the perpetuator of Indian removal. Um, Andrew Jackson, you know, had this strategy for removing all of these Indians, moving tens of thousands of people into a space already occupied by other people um, and giving those new arrivals land that other Indian nations understood to be theirs. So Indian removal caused all sorts of problems between Indian nations. 
Um, and there one particular tribal group called the Osage who lived in what's now Missouri. Um, they lived kind of on both sides of the Mississippi River in Mississippi, uh, Missouri and Oklahoma. And they were caught totally in the middle. All these civilized tribes were being pushed one way, but the Osage couldn't go too far west because the, other, the nations on the plains were much stronger than they were. And so one of the things that happened is that, and this is what scholars of American Indian history have made very clear, is that this caused big intertribal conflict in Indian territory. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of the ways we can see this for the Kiowa is that in 18, was it 1833, um, the Osage come and make this massive attack on them. To they're totally unsuspecting, the Kiowas. It is brutal. Um, it's remembered in their um, historical forms with pictures of people having their heads cut off, right? Just a brutal, brutal attack. And the Kiowas were dumbfounded by it. But one of the reasons it happened was that the Osage were being pushed west and were trying to assert themselves in this new place. So it, and so this leads to this like cycle of violence. Um, so it's a big problem. And I would say there's an analogy, you can see an analogy with how the fur trade disrupted um, the intertribal relations in the American Northeast uh, um, a century earlier. Um, that the arrival and the, the forced movement of people causes Indians themselves to fight with one another. So it's not only the Americans that are the problem. Well, we can uh, continue the conversation in Olson Lounge with coffee and snacks, and then we'll meet back here for Dr. Graber's second lecture at 1045. Um, but first, let's um, join and give further thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.